Today, of course, you have humongous choice. Part of that is in terms of, you know, the, the nature of content, the, nat the, the behavior itself has changed. Right. How we consume. Today, we binge, uh, binge watch on Netflix, right? Unthinkable back then. Today, we see content which we would have never imagined that we could watch on, uh, on Doordarshan or yes. any, any of the other channels. So, I think there has been an overall liberalization in the way we consume media, the way we interact with media, and as a corollary, the way we interact with brands. A piece of research that I did actually showed that the how light or dark the food is that, that you eat. And so the lighter the color, people actually end up eating more of it. And why does that happen? It's a very interesting intuition. So in every religion, every philosophy, every, every culture that you uh, look at this, dark is bad, light is good. And therefore dark represents danger light represents opportunity. And so we, we actually show that in our research that was published in a, in a top journal that uh, you know, this, this is what happens. All right, so here we are uh, sitting at Great Lakes, Chennai, uh, looking forward to an amazing conversation that I am assuming that I might have with uh, Dr. Sridesh Ramanathan. He is a quintessential IIT, IIM graduate who has been to Chicago as well, uh, Chicago booth as well and has taught there as well and we are going to learn a lot from him, his experiences and the nitty-gritty of a dean at Great Lakes Chennai as to what he's trying to build here. Thank you very much, uh, Suresh, for joining us in today. I'm really excited, as I told you, uh, to, to have a conversation with you, not probably about your institute, but probably about marketing, about life, about cinema and about Tamil Nadu itself. We can have a very scintillating conversation. Thank you for having me. Dr. Amnathan, we are talking about a pre-liberalization India, right? Uh, when we are talking about your education that was happening. And in I am Calcutta also, you were there at that point in time. How much of that shift has happened in the education system from there what you have seen to today when you are at a dean's chair and you are seeing these very students coming into your B school and probably are trying to find out what they are good at? I'll give you the good news and the not so good news. So the, the good news is that there is choice. Uh, back then, you only had IMA, BC and Lucknow. None of the other IMs were there. And so either you got into those four or you were, you know, you were somewhere else and, and you had very few other options. XLRI, of course, was there and a few others. So, you know, therefore, you were kind of forced to really try hard. So the not so good news is that precisely because of that choice, I think there is a sense of complacency that begins to set in and people tend to view any, and I'm not just talking about IMs or any, people tend to view B-School as almost like a placement factory. And that bothers me. Uh, very fundamentally it bothers me for the simple reason that the role of a school, a business school, is to transform you. You come in as a raw product, an unfinished product, and you have to walk out of that institution completely transformed. And that process of transformation happened for me when I was in IIM Calcutta. That who I was when I entered and who I became two years later, I mean, there was a fundamental difference because of that experience, because of how I viewed that experience. And today what I find uh, is that there is a certain level of complacency that has begun to set in, which leads to what I might call commoditization of business education in this country that there is no difference between one school and the other. We all teach exactly the same things and we don't challenge our students hard enough. And in that process, what ends up happening is that uh, everybody tends to view one school as just the same as the other. Right. And there is no value that is being created. And so that is really the not so good news. The excellent news is that changes are on the anvil. There are things that are happening. The government has, you know, within the NEP and, and all of that, the government is opening up more competition, bringing in foreign institutions possibly. If, if that forces business schools to basically reevaluate what they're doing, I think that would be a step in the right direction. We have taught certain skills, taught, taught certain subjects to certain students, and then we have left them out in open to uh, fend for themselves in the world which is constantly changing. And if you are not telling them that you need to upskill yourself, they are lost and they don't know how to comprehend with the situation. So in a situation like that, how do you make sure that you make that finished product, actual finished product, which is useful 
for a lot of companies. Very much so. I, I think it's a great question that you're asking because if you look at the typical Indian education system, and I'm, I, I, I can take that kind of a little bit of a dispassionate view because I have been in the Indian edu educational system as well as in the US educational system, so I can do a little bit of a dispassionate comparison. But what I find is that very often, our educational system is geared towards teaching to, to exams. When we teach to exams, we teach in silos. We basically teach marketing, we teach finance, we teach operations, and these are separate subjects. There is absolutely no integration that occurs across all these functional areas. And yet, these students, very students, will graduate, and they go into a job and discover the world is not all that black and white and, and siloed. The world is gray, and there are many, many parts that they have to combine together. And then they struggle. Right. And unless we are ready to, you know, to prepare our students to, to have that, that's you know, going to be a perennial problem. You know, once you were done with your B school, you started off uh, in an SMCG company, right? Uh, and you were a marketer yourself, if I'm not wrong. From there, a lot of things have changed in the market. And you have spent a considerable amount of time, to be precise, I think a decade, uh, you have spent working for different organizations, right? First in an FMCG organization and then you moved to media and we are going to talk about a little later on that. Tell me a little bit about how marketing has shifted from the time that you have started off uh, to now. I, I hear a lot of people saying that, you know, the fundamentals or the cause of marketing will never change, mm -hmm. right? But to me, as somebody who is in his 30s, I see marketing evolving every day. There are some things that haven't changed. The discipline of how you think about the customer has not changed. Right. Customer still has needs, certain motivations, certain goals, uh, emotions, thoughts, feelings. Those things, you know, the fact that they have them has not changed. Maybe the content of what they want may have changed as a function of the times. But the fact that they have these motivations and the fact that these motivations guide behavior continues to remain the same. The practice of sales may have changed as a result of, you know, the advent of technology and tools that we have to track things. Back in the day, you know, when I used to work with, uh, with Brooke Bond Lipton, uh, you know, many, many years ago, before, I mean, a couple of years before it was taken over by Unilever, I was actually training as a salesman, okay? And uh, that was my first thing. I mean, so they, you know, they put you through a management training program and the first 12 weeks you are a salesman. And you're actually managing, you know, a whole inventory of, of tea and coffee and all of that. And you have to take it out into the field and visit every single Kirana shop trying to convince them to buy that one kilo of tea from you or two kilos of tea. And I had to do it in a language that I did not know, right? I was posted in Andhra Pradesh and I had to speak in Telugu, which I had no idea about. I used to go and watch movies every weekend at a movie theater, Telugu movies, just to try and pick up the language. What I'm trying to emphasize here is that those skills on how to sell, uh, how to communicate, how to uh, convince people, those skills are the, very much the same. What used to happen back then is exactly what you need now too. What has changed is the use of technology enablers. You if probably you will. have a Google Translator which can help you. You may, to, yeah, exactly. You know, the time uh, that you shifted to media was the time when change was happening in India in, in a big way. How do you think that the emergence of consumer uh, behavior in a big way came into the uh, forefront for the people as consumers? As someone in, in that business, I just saw how consumers were shifting the way they approached uh, media or media consumption habits per se, right? And today, of course, you have humongous choice. Part of that is in terms of, you know, the, the nature of content, the, the, the behavior itself has changed. Right. How we consume. Today, we binge, binge watch on Netflix, right? Unthinkable back then. Today, we see content which we would have never imagined that we could watch on, uh, on Doordarshan or yes. any, any of the other channels. So, I think there has been an overall liberalization in the way we consume media, the way we interact with media, and as a corollary, the way we interact with brands. Correct. The fact about consumer behavior as to how a lot of things that are associated in the marketing changes the way consumer behave to certain products, certain brands. Uh, you probably have also worked a lot on this particular field where you have seen consumer behavior changing by changing the com kind of colors that a company is using right or the kind of branding or the logo or the kind of messaging that they want to go ahead with there is always a social angle to advertising that we are all you know seeing right now happening in the market so tell us a little bit about that how that uh, changes the perception of a brand so i do a lot of work on uh, 
on perception and uh, particularly things like uh, color perception. One of the fascinating things that we have found is that people are almost non-consciously or automatically responsive to, to subtle changes. All these little things can have a profound influence on our behavior even though we may not be aware of it. Right? So a, a piece of research that I did actually showed that the, how light or dark the food is that, that you eat. And so the lighter the color, people actually end up eating more of it. Dark colored uh, foods are seen to be heavier, richer, and therefore more unhealthy compared to light colored foods. And why does that happen? Uh, it's a very interesting intuition. So in every religion, every philosophy, every, every culture that you uh, look at this, dark is bad, light is good, right? We have a general understanding that light is good. And because we have that basic intuition that is almost innate, right, very early uh, in our childhood, infancy, we kind of learn to associate these things you know, differently. And in fact, we are even hardwired, evolutionarily we are hardwired from the uh, point of view that you know, uh, we are, human beings are diurnal creatures, so we cannot see well in the dark and therefore dark represents danger, light represents opportunity. Right? And therefore you have all these notions in our mind that light is good. And so if light is good, I, can, I will make the assumption that light is also healthy. Light is good for me and therefore I will eat more. And so we, we actually show that in our research that was published in a, in a top journal that uh, you know, this, this is what happens. And we showed the intuition, you know, why it happens and all of that. But so to get back to the point, uh, you're absolutely right that you know, all these kinds of perceptual cues can have a very profound effect on behavior which therefore means from a marketing perspective, as a marketer, I should be aware of the effect of all these cues. So when you make a choice in terms of your packaging design, uh, the colors that you use, or any other perceptual cues that you may play, you know, the, you know how the font looks, variety of things. That also brings in the marketing mix into the picture also, you know, uh, how uh, deep do you want to reach uh, with your product, with the kind of consumers that you are targeting, right? Uh, for example, how social is your brand is also an equity that you're giving to your brand or the product right how do you make that choice and decision uh, as a marketing manager brands may try too hard to be social uh, and engage with their customers but you have to understand the nature of the relationship the brand and the customer have if the relationship between the customer and the brand is transactional no amount of social engagement is going to work right what is the locus of the relationship that you have with the brand or the customer has with the brand uh, if that locus is basically transactional and they're basically just looking for price and, and some very basic quality dimensions, then there is very little that you can do to influence them socially. When are you most likely to be subject to social influence? When you know, it is more experiential, when there is, you know, there is a lot of, sometimes if there is uncertainty about quality of the product or you rely a lot on the word of others uh, to make a judgment on whether you should buy this product, that's when social campaigns actually work. I do feel that many brands try too hard because they try to jump on the bandwagon and try to say that, oh, I need to have a presence on, on Twitter and I need to have a presence on, on Insta and so on. Who's watching your stuff? One example that you want to share, a brand or a product or a company which has done consumer behavior in a very right way. Brands like Dove come to mind very clearly that they, well, long before it became fashionable to kind of appear woke, they actually did so. Uh, their entire campaign uh, for real beauty, I think, was, was brilliant, right? And, you know, they, they managed to carve out a very clear impression in, in a large part of the market. I can think of brands like that, that have been bold enough to take positions which are different from the mainstream, which I think is, is great. Let's shift our uh, gaze a little bit from marketing uh, to something that you probably have done next in your uh, career, which was going back to academics. Right, you uh, decided that you want to study again. You decided that you want to do your PhD, and that's how you went to US. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that journey. When did you decide that this was needed in your career? And would you suggest that students of today do the same thing? Ten years it took me to realize that my true calling was academia. I don't think I would advise anyone to spend ten years and then discover that they. I think today's generation is far, far more clear about their goals. Uh, back then, I didn't know what I wanted. One of the things that I discovered was that, yeah, you know, you may move from uh, company to company, uh, role to role, designation to designation. If intellectually you're not growing, 
and you're doing exactly the same thing, then you are not really growing as an individual. And for me, the aha moment actually happened when I went to the, I was, I was in Bangalore back then and I was at the IM Bangalore library and I started looking at uh, some of the academic journals in marketing. I just read some articles and it just completely fascinated me. It was like, you know, this is a new world. I have no idea. I had no idea that, you know, there is something like this. And I was, you know, looking after media research at this agency called McCann Erickson. And, uh, you know, I just said, you know, this is, this is amazing. I right. want to do more on this. And that's, that's the start. You know, I just applied, uh, told myself, if I get a good GMAT score, I will go. And I got a good GMAT score and told my wife, yeah, you know, we need to go. And we had two children. Uh, and despite that, we just decided, you know, we're just going. And I ended up in New York. Uh, so, yeah, so I was at NYU, uh, you know, at, at Stern School of Business. But if you were to ask me, yeah, you know, would you advise the next generation to do this? I would say I took a really, really big risk huh. to give up a career. Uh, you know, I was doing quite well. Uh, and I took a risk to start over all over again. For me, it is all about finding something meaningful to do. Uh, and, and that's in fact even why I gave up tenure in the US to come back to, to India to become the dean here. Uh, again, a disruption. You probably are seeing some of these students coming in from different sectors and uh, you know, domains as well. Uh, how do you see you know, their transformation to be? What are some of the things that you probably have inculcated in them, you feel, that has transform their journey on the way they see their careers to be? I think the, the biggest transformation we see is with people who are used to thinking in a very linear fashion. I think any business school uh, has probably around 60-70% who are engineers. Right. You know, myself included, right? I mean, that's, that's how I joined uh, IM Calcutta. I would say that many of us are trained to think about problems in a certain way. And it tends to be linear and there is also a lot of groupthink. We all tend to think exactly the same way. In a school like ours, one of the things that we are really encouraging is, I mean, we embrace the diversity that, you know, there are people from different states, but beyond that, you know, put them in groups where they come from different backgrounds so that, you know, they are more appreciative of, uh, of different perspectives. And I think through the course, what we are really trying to uh, inculcate is the ability to synthesize. And as you remember, I, I, mean, I recall, I, I mentioned this aspect of integrating, synthesizing, problem solving. That's something which is very important. And we're trying to build that into our curriculum, you know, and, and try to make sure that our students have those skills. Absolutely. So to me, that represents the biggest change when they graduate. I would say many of them have developed that. Not everybody, but many of them have developed that. It's not like marketing is enough now. Yeah. You have to include tech in that. Keeping that in mind, the academic pedagogy that you have here, how do you think that you are doing justice to that? I think that's a very critical uh, skill or uh, functional knowledge that students need to have now. There is a lot of data. The other day I was talking to one of my former students who said that you know he had to deal with some like five lakh you know data points. Okay, and a uh, huge amount of data and you know, Excel can never accommodate that. And so you know, how, how do you learn to you know, bring that data set and, uh, you know, into the system and then analyze it and all of that. So there are lots of things that students need to know. You know at, at Great Lakes, we have always prided ourselves uh, on our focus on analytics. And uh, so marketing analytics or MarTech as you call it, I think you know, we are very, very uh, cognizant. Just to give you a little example of why, you know, how, how important we think it is just Tomorrow, we're going to have a kind of a workshop uh, being taught by five different faculty uh, from international institutions, including Stanford and Chicago Booth and, and, and others, Texas A&M as well, where, uh, and Yale. Uh, so they're actually going to talk about how machine learning, Bayesian statistics, all of these can actually be applied in marketing. And uh, this is something that all our students are welcome to attend. Uh, but certainly anyone who is deeply interested in uh, you know, research on this topic or trying to understand a lot more about it, they would benefit a lot from it. So we are clearly trying to emphasize the fact that analytics and, and marketing are intertwined with each other. Analytics is not simply about, uh, you know, learning machine learning and, and uh, you know, and uh, things like that or AI and that's important. You need to know that, but you also need to know how to apply that in the context of marketing. And so we see that uh, constantly playing out. How is your interaction with the students here? Do you see that they feel uh, inhibited uh, to come to you or they, they open up and they talk to you and what sort of a culture uh, are you building? One of the things uh, that I emphasized from day one is that I'm a very, very approachable person. 
uh, anyone can come to me with any problems. Uh, I have had people talking about you know dogs on campus, and we have had people talking about many more serious issues. And so uh, I engage a lot with the students. Dr. Ramanathan, uh, I would like to know your vision with this particular institute that you are a dean of now. Uh, how much time have you spent here already Three as years. a dean? What does it look like in the future? What are you trying to build? So let me uh, try to answer the first part. First part is what is my vision? Uh, so I joined three years ago. I came in with the mandate of trying to take the school into the what the founder Dr. Bala called from good to great. And he also talked about success and substance. So success is not enough, substance is also important. And so with both of these ideas, uh, what I'm really kind of uh, influenced by or what really guides me is the need to pursue excellence in whatever we do and in, in order to strive for excellence we need to challenge ourselves on all the dimensions. Certainly we need to challenge ourselves in terms of making sure that our curriculum is always relevant and contemporary and in fact actually ahead of what is required. Uh, certainly in terms of research we need to challenge ourselves to make sure that we are pushing the envelope and uh, in terms of um, you know directions for the future make sure that we are uh, more broadly you know strategically saying uh, that we are actually we, ha we are an institution with a point of difference that we are not just another commoditized business school that I referred to right at the beginning. That I don't want to be just another business school. I want to be a business school which is, which is different, which has a point of view, which will not hesitate to challenge itself and disrupt itself if need be uh, so that it can stay ahead of the times. What is your advice to students who want to be part of this thriving culture that you have created or built uh, over the years in this particular institute? If I have to give advice to anyone, uh, and, and my advice is not specifically limited to Great Lakes. I can just say that the advice would be to anyone interested in joining any business school. It is to develop a sense of curiosity. I find given the relative uh, decline in attention people are paying to things because we have so many other things that compete for our attention, I find our curiosity has gone down. Absolutely. Okay. Our need to learn to uh, to want to know something more, to dig deep, that seems to have disappeared. And uh, unfortunately, you know, when you appear for a job interview, you'll get found out very, very fast. If you don't have curiosity, you would not give you, you would not be able to give me anything beyond the headlines. And I think that really bothers me because uh, I, I want the next generation to be absolutely curious about, you know, things just learn different you never know where it'll come in handy you just need to equip yourself with knowledge no matter where it is and what it is all about and that curiosity if you are able to develop you will go really far wow that's some amazing amazing uh, insight uh, dr ramnathan it indeed was a fantastic session uh, for me it was enlightening for me as well and i hope that uh, people who are listening to this students who are hearing you today uh, would find this interesting and engaging uh, knowing you as a person probably would also be uh, icing in the cake for them and thank you very much for doing that uh, with us today and giving us uh, your time if you like the conversation do tell us in the comments below what you liked more if you want to know more about the institute that uh, dr ramnathan is building uh, there's a link in the description go check that out and do share this video with whoever finds it uh, engaging and interesting thank you once again thank dr you. ramnathan i really appreciate appreciate it, it. Thank, thank you, you so much, much. yeah